I'm Max Feinstein and I'm an anesthesia resident at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City. It's been said that anesthesiology is characterized by hours of boredom punctuated by moments of terror. And in this video, I'm going to be discussing something that can lead to moments of terror, a rare but potentially life-threatening condition called malignant hyperthermia. If you find this video interesting or helpful, I'd really appreciate it if you liked it and subscribed to the channel. Let's dive in. Malignant hyperthermia can be defined as a life-threatening hypermetabolic state characterized by dysregulated calcium, which, as you may know, plays a paramount role in muscle contraction. Who does malignant hyperthermia affect? It affects people who are both genetically susceptible and have received exposure to a triggering agent. And those include a depolarizing neuromuscular blocking drug called succinylcholine, as well as several anesthetic gases, including isoflurane, sevoflurane, and desflurane, and also halothane, However, halothane is not used very commonly in the United States, although it is currently used in a number of other places around the world, so depending on where you're practicing, this might be relevant. How frequent is it to be genetically susceptible to malignant hyperthermia? It's more prevalent in kids with an estimated prevalence of 1 in 15,000 pediatric patients and less prevalent in adults with an estimated prevalence of 1 in 40,000 patients. It's really important to keep in mind that even if someone is genetically susceptible to malignant hyperthermia, that does not necessarily mean that exposure to a triggering agent is going to cause an episode of malignant hyperthermia. And that brings me to my next point, which is how often an anesthesiologist might actually expect to see malignant hyperthermia. A study that was published about 10 years ago found that there were 84 identified and reported events of malignant hyperthermia that occurred over a five-year period. And out of those 84 events, eight of those patients died. That means that over the study period, about 1.6 people died in the United States every year from an episode of malignant hyperthermia. By way of comparison, every year in the United States, an average of 62 people are killed from a lightning strike. That means that on average, in a given year in the United States, a person is about 39 times more likely to die from a lightning strike than they are from an episode of malignant hyperthermia. And the really important qualifier for that is that if an anesthesiologist is prepared, then identifying and treating malignant hyperthermia can be life-saving. How do you treat a patient who you think may have malignant hyperthermia? Well, first it's important to understand what exactly is going on when an episode of malignant hyperthermia occurs. If someone who's genetically susceptible is exposed to a triggering agent, it may cause an uncontrolled release of calcium in cells basically throughout the body. This uncontrolled calcium release occurs in muscles throughout the body, causing them to contract, which is a process that uses a lot of energy, a lot of oxygen, and produces a lot of carbon dioxide, or CO2. There are a number of significant complications that can arise from an episode of malignant hyperthermia, and one that can manifest immediately and be life-threatening is hyperkalemia, which is elevated potassium levels throughout the body, which can occur because potassium regulation is also thrown off during an episode of malignant hyperthermia. This, in and of itself, can lead to a fatal cardiac arrest. Just as an aside, for anyone thinking about a career in anesthesiology, it's worth pointing out that we are experts in resuscitation, including advanced cardiac life support. So if there's a cardiac arrest or any other type of life-threatening event that occurs in or near an operating room, then we are very well equipped to handle that. Other potential complications of malignant hyperthermia include a condition called disseminated intravascular coagulation, which in and of itself can be fatal, as well as organ failure of basically any organ, especially including the brain as well as the kidneys. Studies show that the mortality rate associated with an episode of malignant hyperthermia ranges from 5% to 30%, where faster time to treatment is going to lead to improved survival. So how do you take care of a patient who may have malignant hyperthermia and be susceptible to having an event during your anesthetic? The first consideration is to make your patient the first patient of the day. Reason being that studies have demonstrated that overnight, the triggering agents that are present inside of anesthesia machines actually degrade when the machine is not in use. So you don't want to be using a triggering agent like isoflurane or sevoflurane throughout the course of the day and then take care of a patient using that same machine 
which may have some lingering molecules of a triggering agent inside of it. Then as far as the machine itself is concerned, you actually want to remove every replaceable part that could potentially have come into contact with the triggering agent. That includes the entire breathing circuit, the absorbent, and if it's possible to remove the vaporizers from the machine, then you should go ahead and take those off. If it's not possible to remove the vaporizers, then at the very least, cover them in red tape so it's abundantly clear that they shouldn't be used. Then if you have charcoal filters available, go ahead and place those on your circuit and flush the circuit and the anesthesia machine for a certain period of time, depending on whether you have filters on and what type of anesthesia machine you're using. I should point out that if you're not able to use charcoal filters, then it's really important to keep your gas flows high throughout the course of the anesthetic because it's possible for triggering agents to reaccumulate if the flows aren't high enough. A big challenge for anesthesiologists is that an episode of malignant hyperthermia isn't always very easy to identify, but if you think that your patient may be having an episode, it's extraordinarily important to initiate treatment as early as possible. Due to the muscle contractions that happen throughout the body during an episode of malignant hyperthermia, one of the signs that may tip you off that your patient's having an episode is muscle rigidity throughout the body and especially in the masseter muscles of the face. Keep in mind that muscle rigidity doesn't always happen during malignant hyperthermia and also keep in mind that other conditions like neuroleptic malignant syndrome can also cause muscle rigidity. So this in and of itself isn't going to be the single diagnostic indicator that a patient's actually having an episode. Another really important sign that your patient may be having an episode of malignant hyperthermia is hypercarbia, which means increased levels of CO2. Monitoring a patient's exhaled CO2 is one of the American Society of Anesthesiologists standards of care. So we're always watching a patient's end tidal CO2, which means what they're breathing off. And so if that end tidal CO2 is rising, and especially if a patient is intubated and we try to breathe off that CO2 by either increasing the respiratory rate and or increasing the tidal volumes, but the CO2 is not going down, then we have another indicator that the patient may be having an episode of malignant hyperthermia. Other less specific signs of malignant hyperthermia, meaning ones that can be present in a number of different conditions, include tachycardia or an increased heart rate, as well as an increased temperature, hence the name malignant hyperthermia. Keep in mind that monitoring temperature is part of the American Society for Anesthesiologists standards for basic anesthetic monitoring. Overall, making an intraoperative diagnosis of malignant hyperthermia can be pretty hard to do, but you have a higher likelihood of making correct diagnosis if there are at least two signs that are present. As far as timing goes, the majority of episodes of malignant hyperthermia occur in the operating room during the delivery of anesthesia, and only a small proportion of them occur after anesthesia has finished in the post-anesthesia care unit. If you're delivering anesthesia and you suspect that a patient is undergoing an episode of malignant hyperthermia, then the very first thing that you need to do is discontinue whatever triggering agents are currently being administered. That might include isoflurane or sevoflurane. It's pretty unlikely that you have a succinylcholine infusion going, but if you do, then you should stop that. If the surgery needs to continue, but you've just turned off an inhaled anesthetic maintenance agent, then you'll need to switch over to a total IV anesthesia, or TIVA for short. This commonly includes propofol, which is not a triggering agent for malignant hyperthermia. The next extremely time-sensitive intervention that needs to occur is the administration of the treatment, which is dantrolene. Dantrolene is a medication that blocks calcium release from muscles and thereby inhibits the pathophysiology of what's going on during an episode of malignant hyperthermia. A patient's survival of an episode of malignant hyperthermia is directly related to the amount of time that it takes for dantrolene to be administered. For those who are interested, the dose of dantrolene is 2.5 milligrams per kilogram administered every five minutes, and it's important to monitor a patient's vital signs for resolution of symptoms. And also keep in mind that treatment with dantrolene may need to continue even after symptoms have resolved because it's possible for them to reoccur. Dantrolene is an extremely expensive medication, and for that reason, it's not routinely kept in carts in every single operating room, but rather in its own cart that's located centrally to all of the operating rooms. I've covered medication cost in one of my previous videos, and I will say that that became a very controversial subject, but I will just say that objectively speaking, the wholesale cost, so what a hospital pays in the United States on average 
for a vial of dantrolene is $2,581 for 250 milligrams. That's the cost for a formulation of dantrolene that can be reconstituted into 5 cc's of sterile water and then injected. That contrasts with the other formulation of intravenous dantrolene, which comes as 20 milligram vials that cost $62 each, but each vial needs to be mixed with 60 cc's of sterile water. From a practical standpoint, this formulation of dantrolene is actually really tedious to use because it takes a long time to draw up enough dantrolene to administer to a patient who's having an episode of malignant hyperthermia. One also cannot talk about dantrolene without mentioning that calcium channel blockers are contraindicated because the use of calcium channel blockers with dantrolene can precipitate a life-threatening hyperkalemic arrest. Also kept in the cart is refrigerated IV fluid, and in this case, that's isolite. The administration of cold IV fluids is one of the most effective ways to rapidly cool a patient. Another medication kept in the malignant hyperthermia cart is a medication called bicarbonate, which can decrease the acidity of urine, thereby decreasing the likelihood of kidney damage resulting from myoglobin, which came from ruptured muscle cells. To that end, a diuretic called furosemide is also recommended for treatment during a malignant hyperthermia episode because that can increase urine output and theoretically decrease the amount of renal damage. The malignant hyperthermia cart also includes insulin, which drives potassium inside of cells, decreasing the likelihood of life-threatening hyperkalemia. And if you're going to be administering insulin, then in order to keep the patient's blood sugar from bottoming out, you'll also probably need to administer dextrose, which is kept in the cart as well. The recommended ventilator settings for treating a patient with a suspected episode of malignant hyperthermia is 100% FiO2 at high flows and hyperventilating the patient to try to get the carbon dioxide off as much as possible. Other important steps for treating malignant hyperthermia include making sure that a patient's urine is being closely monitored, so a Foley catheter will need to be inserted if it's not already inserted, and the patient will need to be very closely monitored in the ICU after leaving the operating room. And if there's any question about how to treat a patient with a suspected episode of malignant hyperthermia, there's actually a hotline that's staffed 24-7 by experts who can guide you through any questions that you may have. There are several ways that susceptibility to malignant hyperthermia can be diagnosed. One is a fairly invasive diagnostic test that is not done in very many places in the United States and also happens to be really expensive, and that's called a caffeine halothane contracture test. That basically entails taking a fairly sizable amount of a muscle sample and then exposing it to both halothane, which is an anesthetic agent, as well as caffeine and seeing if the muscle contracts. Because this test is so invasive and expensive and inconvenient, it's not routinely done except in people who have a high suspicion of having had an episode of malignant hyperthermia. And even in that case, this test can't be done within six months of a suspected episode of malignant hyperthermia because it can throw off the test results. Another way of identifying people who are susceptible to malignant hyperthermia is a blood test that can identify certain genes that predispose someone to it. However, these are not particularly sensitive genetic tests, which means they don't always pick up when somebody has susceptibility to malignant hyperthermia. That's because there are a lot of different genetic mutations that can lead to malignant hyperthermia, and we don't know what all of those genetic markers are, so we can't test for all of them. So if a patient's had a negative blood test, that's not necessarily helpful, but if a patient has a positive blood test, then that can be something that can be helpful in allowing other family members who are genetically related to get identified as carriers of a genetic mutation that can lead to susceptibility for malignant hyperthermia. If you do have questions or concerns about malignant hyperthermia, the person that you need to speak with is your doctor because this is a YouTube video and this is not medical advice. If you found this video interesting, you might wanna check out this video where I go through a totally different type of emergency that I actually did experience in an operating room. Thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next time.